Well, I'll tell you, I had a little bit of difficulty deciding where to go tonight in the Scriptures. I, uh, I love to try to find a connecting point between Sundays, and this one was a little more challenging because uh, we were at a point in Colossians on Sunday mornings where uh, we're at the conclusion to the letter. This Sunday morning is going to be the last little paragraph, the last set of verses. Paul's concluding. He's mentioning the names of a lot of people and how he's even mentioning the names of the people who's going to carry that letter to the church and uh, all these mentioning all these folks who are serving and make sure you greet this person and greet this person. So it's kind of it's a challenge to try to connect from where we were about devoting ourselves to prayer and being wise in our evangelistic efforts as we speak to others about the gospel. So here's where I ended up landing for tonight. It took me, and if you take notes, if you write things in your Bible, you might have a note on this one. It took me back to April of 2018. The first time I stepped into that pulpit, and we were in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And the more I read it, the more I had a, a very fond memory just come over me of, of when I first uh, stepped into this room to preach. And 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the first five verses... And the reason why I landed in this scripture tonight is because the more I contemplated where we were this past Sunday in Colossians, devoting ourselves to prayer, praying for ourselves, praying for our brothers and sisters, but then being wise toward others with the gospel. So the whole focus of that was to rely on God's word, rely on the gospel, on the the message that God has given us to share, we have to trust that message in order to be uh, confident in sharing it, right? Uh, you, ever, you ever been somewhere or see something and maybe you were a part of it or you were just an observer, but whatever the case, it was just, it made such an impression on you you just couldn't wait to tell the story about it. Like you, maybe you traveled somewhere and you saw something amazing. You just really wanted to tell somebody about it. You know, you were, you you just kind of couldn't hold it in. You said, "Oh, I can't wait to tell my friends about this." Right? Uh, kind of like uh, back in 2001 when uh, when I came up on the bear in Yellowstone. I that was that's a good story because that's never happened to me since and it had not happened to me before. And I hope it never does happen again walking up on a bear in the woods, but that's a good story, and I wanted to tell people. Well, here's the thing. Are we as anxious to tell people about Jesus as we are anxious to tell them about this event or that experience or things like that? You know what I'm saying? Are we that excited to tell people about Jesus? I don't, sometimes I don't think we, we may be. But this scripture here, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the first five verses... Uh, really, really highlights how Paul's perspective really leaned on trusting in, in Jesus and His Word. And Paul, and this is why this is important, think about, who, when we read this and we talk about it, think about who Paul was. He was super smart, top of his class in the Pharisee school. I mean, he knew the scriptures backward and forward. I mean, he really knew, especially the, I mean, we're talking about the Old Testament scriptures is what they studied. He knew those things really well. He was super intelligent. And so then when God redirected his life and he began to preach the gospel and use all those skills that God had put in him for the right purpose, if anybody had a reason to brag, right, about his uh, knowledge and his oratorical skills, it was Paul. I mean, he, he was the man. Everybody would be in awe of him and his abilities. 
And even so, he didn't want anybody trusting in him and his ability. He wanted everybody to trust in Jesus and the Word, which makes a statement. right? If someone that skilled and knowledgeable still doesn't want anyone to trust in, in who he is and wants everybody to look to Jesus, that ought to help us. That you know, It doesn't matter where we are on that spectrum of Bible knowledge or confidence in sharing or ability to speak to people, whether in uh, small groups or large groups, wherever we fall in that, in that uh, area, uh, we need to still trust in Jesus and not in our own abilities. Right, that's that's a comfort to me. Uh, so it doesn't matter. I mean, we always want to do our best, but ultimately we want people to trust in the Lord, not in us. So let me read. I'm actually going to back up. Let me back up to First Corinthians chapter one, verse twenty-six, because that kind of gives us the good context leading into chapter two, and we'll focus on the first five verses of chapter two. But here's what the Bible says: First uh, Corinthians chapter one, verse twenty-six. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, and the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen, the things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Lord, help us to understand your word tonight, that we might do what it says for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Our faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. That ought to be like a motto, right? We don't want to trust human wisdom. We always want to defer to God's power. And His power is we, it's on display right here in the Word. And then we read the Word, and once we read the Word, then we only... We, we read about His power, then we see it and experience uh, what He's doing because of what He tells us in His Word. So, if you remember, this is the first... We got two letters to, to the city of Corinth, the church in Corinth, but history will say that Paul wrote one, maybe two more letters to this church, but only these two um, met the criteria to be considered divinely inspired, but he corresponded with them often, more often than what we have here. Uh, but these two are in particular. This, this letter here, if you think about what he's doing and the, the people he is addressing, the, the city and the church, Paul was there about midway in the first century, about A.D. 50. Okay? And so then there were... Uh, multiple people in the church, Jews and Gentiles. And so then he wrote this letter back to them about five or six years after that. So it, it had been a few years since he had been there with them. And he's uh, addressing all kind of different things throughout this, this letter and in the Second Corinthians as well. But they're dealing with problems. They're in a city that's terribly sinful. And 
as, as I've said before, about this city and this church, one of their, like, like a summary of their issues was that the city and the culture was having more of an influence on the church than the church was having on the culture. It was, it was the opposite of what should have been going on, right? And so Paul's writing and trying to help them, addressing maybe some inconsistencies in their Christian living, some doctrinal issues, some morality issues. And so this church is experiencing these problems much because of the culture and the influence they're having. So when he gets here, he's reminding them, hey, don't you remember, it wasn't but just a few years ago, I was there. I know what you're dealing with. I saw it. I observed it myself. So let me help you. Let me uh, try to point you in the right direction based on what I taught you when I was there and just a reminder of what you still need to hang on to. So here's, here's what he looks like uh, when he starts to write this letter. If you, if you heard the words he used in that introduction, those, the last six verses in chapter 1, he's trying to let the church remember when they got saved. So it's as if, all right, if he wrote the letter to us here, he'd be saying to all of us, don't you remember... When God called you, when you got saved, when you believed in Jesus. Remember back when you believed in Jesus. Remember uh, what kind of state of being you were in. And he's, he's painting that picture. Because if you look at verse 26 and 27, he's saying, when you got saved, it wasn't because you were real smart. It wasn't because you were in the right family. It wasn't because you had a good social standing in the, in the community. In other words, he didn't pick an all-star team. He just picked just every day, run-of-the-mill, nothing special about you. He just picked regular folks. And, and, so, and so when people got saved, they needed to understand, hey, you don't have to be top of your class or in the right social group or have a lot of money or you, you don't have to be at the top of the categories from the world's viewpoint in order to be valuable in the kingdom of God. And that's, he's trying to help them remember that. Think back to when you got saved. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. Because verse 31... Let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. In other words, hey, if God picks people who don't stand out in the world's eyes, and yet He does something miraculous through them, then where does all the attention go? It goes to God, which is where it should go, right? So that way, if He picked, just think, just think if God tried to use all the people that the world thinks are amazing. For example, who's popular in the world's eyes today? Who would, who would you think, whether it be musician or business leader or athlete or, or anybody like that, who, who's popular that you can think of right now in the world's eyes? Any names pop to, come to mind? Serena Williams? Oh, obviously. Obviously. That her her last tennis match in the history of the US Open most watched, most viewers of any tennis match for them. So Serena Williams for sure. Who else? Taylor Swift, very popular singer, okay? Um you could you could grab somebody like uh, Bill Gates. You know, in the business world, um, I'm trying to think, maybe it's a a um, a popular politician in the world's eyes. <laughs> could be, could be. Yeah, politicians aren't too popular, right? Yeah, yeah, they shouldn't be anyway. Uh, maybe it's uh, you mentioned Serena Williams, so maybe it's um, somebody like LeBron James. In you know basketball, or maybe somebody like uh, Tom Brady in football, you know, 
or maybe it's a, a coach like Nick Saban or Kirby Smart, some of these really, you know, really well-known college or, or NFL folks. Uh, that's just a, that's a, an example. Those are people who are very uh, popular in the culture. So if they are known in the world as having certain skill sets or certain accomplishments or things like that, and God were to use them to do something, what would be the temptation? Oh, oh, absolutely. Glory for them, right? Well, God's going to use uh, Serena Williams to be a spokesperson for a particular subject. Well, she's already wildly popular, right? So yeah, that would be, well, everybody's listening to her because look at who she is. Or... Tom Brady, who you know, because he's a accomplished Super Bowl winning quarterback in the NFL and won numerous Super Bowls, and so he gets these endorsement deals for these products and he does these commercials. And well, of course, people are going to want to buy those things because it's Tom Brady, right? He's a, he's amazing. So all the attention goes to the individual. Well, see, God didn't do that. God picked people that the world did not take notice of. He picked ordinary people to do extraordinary things so that when those things happened, the world that watched would have to say, well, how in the world did that person do this? And then they could say, let me tell you about Jesus. Because Jesus is the reason why this happened. That's every time Jesus did a miracle and the person who got healed, uh, well, the Pharisees are all mad. You know, half the time, he, every, every time he went to, to do something good for someone, they got upset. And so what did the person who got healed? Well, I don't ask him. He's the one who did it. It was always point to Jesus, point to Jesus. He's the one who did the miracle. So what Paul's helping us to understand is there's an inherent weakness in us weakness in man okay so the first three verses tell us we need to recognize uh, the weakness that is in humanity uh, because this this gospel message that we have it's a it's a mysterious testimony it's revealed by god it's not human opinion it's it's not uh, something that we came up with so paul says when i he first said remember when you got saved then he says remember when i was there so he's calling on their memory. When I came to you, I didn't come with superiority of speech or wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. So he's making a point to say, I could have done that. He's got the skills to walk in and say, all right, y'all, y'all, I'm important. Sit down. Listen to what I've got to say. You know, look at me. And But that's not what he did. He He was humble. He was unassuming. He focused not on himself, but on the words of God. So it wasn't about the messenger, it was about the message. It was all about Jesus. So he says, I didn't do those things. I didn't come with this kind of speech and wisdom. I determined, verse 2, to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So his main priority was all about Jesus and the gospel, crucified. His life, his death, his resurrection, the gospel message that demands a response, that was all he wanted them to know about. He didn't focus on any of his own accomplishments. And then in verse 3 he says, Remember how I lived when I was with you. He mentions three words. Weakness, fear, and trembling. And so when you look at those words, they're very specific. Uh, and if you wanted to if you want to look at another section of scripture of Paul's letters, you can go to Philippians chapter two, verses twelve and thirteen. If you want to note that, that he he uses two of these three words exactly, same words. When he says, Work out your own salvation in fear and trembling, that that's the same words that he's talking about here. And so he's reminding them Hey, the, the gospel is serious business. And Paul is t reminding them, I experienced 
weakness and fear and trembling. I was not uh, arrogant or, you know, he was confident in the gospel, but not in himself. And so he wasn't acting like he was something special. He was uh, weak, fearful, trembling among them. And so he's trying to remind them uh, that he, he was not uh, overconfident in himself. He was always focused on the gospel, focused on Jesus. So if you think about his approach, it's always about Jesus. He could have taught... He, there's all kind of things he could have spoken about. Maybe people would have wanted to know about his own personal testimony because it was dynamic, right? His, his salvation experience was amazing. And, and I, don't you think if people knew that and heard about him, hey, t- tell us about D- the Damascus Road. Tell me that story. I, I want to hear more. I mean, because that's exciting, right? He, he's going down the road and gets blinded and, uh, and he, he hears God. G- Jesus himself is speaking to him. And, and uh, that whole next few days where Ananias comes and the scales fall and he goes and starts preaching and nobody believes that he's really um, preaching for the, the sake of the gospel. They think they're, they're still scared of him. And uh, that, whole, that whole scene there was just amazing. But he didn't do that. He just talked about Jesus. So what's our lesson there? There's all kind of things we can talk about. And maybe we talk about some superficial things to kind of break the ice or open a conversation. You know, maybe find a common interest with somebody so we can start uh, talking with them. But what's our goal? It ought to be, our goal ought to be always, let me tell you about Jesus. I can tell you what Jesus did in my life, but let me tell you about Jesus and what He'll do in your life. The, the gospel story is always supposed to be front and center. Even if we're using other things to get there, the gospel is always the focus. That's why, we're, that's why we even call these things... Uh, Gospel conversations. When you talk, you know, when you tell somebody about Jesus, it's a gospel conversation. We're talking about the story of Christ, and I, I mentioned to you before um, the opportunities I've had to go to South America, to Peru, and where I went, and the people I was able to talk to, and and in those experiences, I'm in a, a different culture with different people with a different language, and you know, there's plenty of stuff that, that I would enjoy talking about. Maybe I want to talk about hunting. Maybe I want to ask them if there's any animals I can hunt in Peru, you know, because that would be kind of cool, right? Uh, they got a bunch of alpacas up there, I know, and uh, that alpaca fur is pretty, you know, pretty uh, in demand, so that I might could bring a few of them back and make some money or something, you know. And they got these little chinchillas that run around all over the hills and everything, look like an overgrown rabbit. And, uh, the, you know, that might be fun to hunt. Um, but is that, that what I need to talk about? Or maybe I want to t- teach them about American football. You know, they play a lot of soccer up there. Maybe I want to tell them about how awesome Clemson is, in, in my estimation. Or maybe, you know, tell them about something in the United States. But that's not, that's not what I need to do, right? I, mean, I flew all the way down to, to Peru and then I ride a van eight hours up into the, the top of the Andes Mountains to this little village at the end of the road. And what am I going to talk about? I didn't go that, all that trouble and distance to talk about the weather, right? I went there to tell them about Jesus. And that That's the most important thing. So... The question for us then is, if that's how missions is done, you have a priority and a focus and you go to great lengths sometimes, distance and resources and energy and effort to get to a a place and then you're just going to talk about nonsense? Of course not. You're going to make the most of your time. You're going to talk about Jesus. You're going to ask him 
Have you heard the story of the Messiah? Do you know who Jesus is? Let me tell you about Him. And, and let me show you His Word. Let me help you understand. You know, you do everything you can to try to share the love of Christ with folks. Well, if that's how mission works, then why should it be any different when we're in a, a safe, comfortable environment where there is no language barrier and there is no culture barrier and there is no, uh, I'm going to get on a plane and go 4,000 miles. Or, you know, it's I'm, I'm here. So shouldn't we... Shouldn't we go about it pretty much the same way? What do we talk about when we're here? When we when we get together on Sundays and Wednesdays, what do we talk about? Do we just just think about that? Think about that for a minute. Because I'm I am on the top of the guilty list. I'm not calling y'all out. I'm I'm in this too. I talk about football. I talk about hunting. I talk about the weather. I t- talk about what people are doing and where they're going and, you know, who's going off to school or who, you know. I, I talk about all that. But where's what's the balance? Do we talk about that stuff but don't talk much about Jesus? And I, I'm not talking about up here or in Sunday school. I'm talking about when we're just talking amongst ourselves. What are we talking about? Is there some eternal value? That's all I'm saying. We, we should probably consider uh, what are we talking about amongst ourselves? Hey, are you doing okay this week? How can I pray for you? Is there anything that, that I can really just uh, I want to. I want to pray for you. I want to lift you up this week. How, how can I do that? How can I be a blessing to you this week? Are we asking questions like that? Are we? You know, and maybe we are to some extent, and that that's great. But shouldn't that be in the balance of things? Shouldn't that be higher on the priority list than uh, some other things? It's just a question, a, cre- a question we should probably consider. So we talk about the weakness of men, then we look at the power of God, the last two verses. See, Paul's message was not using all the resources he had available, all his persuasive words and his skill in oratorical presentation and all the wisdom he had developed from knowing the Scriptures so well and being educated in the the Pharisaical school and all these different things. He says in verse 4, specifically that his message and his preaching were not like that. But instead, he says, it was a demonstration of the Holy Spirit, the power of God. And and why would he do that? Again, focus on Jesus, not on him. It's about the message, not the messenger. And so he wanted to remind these Christians here in this Corinthian church... Remember what I said. My preaching was not filled with all this persuasion and all this great rhetoric. It was the Holy Spirit at work. And look at verse 5, the last verse. This is the reason for all this. Why did he do that? Why didn't he use the skills he had to point to him? Verse 5 says, So that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. So he knew... If he came in there using all his stuff he had that he was capable of doing, he knew there would be the potential that people might be impressed with him instead of impressed with God. So so here's, here's the summation of all that. I believe, and, and, and don't get me wrong, when I, when I prepare and study and, and pray and I stand up to preach, I want you to know that I am, I'm trying my very best. I really am. 
I, I don't I don't want to come in here halfway. I, I want to I want to give it everything I got. But when we leave after we've been together, after the word has been preached and and heard, we don't need to ever be. Oh, I don't see how I can say this. I'd much rather we all walk out of here saying, uh, not saying, oh, that was that sure was a good sermon. I'd, I'd much rather we all leave here saying, man, Jesus is something else. We we have such an amazing God. That's that's what we ought to be thinking. It should. Ne- I mean, and I'm and that's that's why this is so difficult because I want to. Man, I want to every week. I want to do it better than I did the week before. I want to. I want to preach a good, clear, God honoring message. And, and at the same time, I don't. I don't want people to know. <laughs> you see, do you hear what I'm saying? I don't want people to to notice uh, the preaching more than the than the the Jesus that's in the in the message. We all need to be pointed to Jesus. Our faith can't rest on any preacher. It's always got to be the power of God. Because I think I've told you this before. If I can talk you into Christianity, somebody else can talk you out of it. Because there's plenty of people smarter than me. <laughs> I appreciate that. But there, there's there's plenty of people that can say it better than I can, and be more persuasive than I can. And they, man, I've I've heard them. I've heard many of them. And man, I just sit there in awe, thinking, man, I wonder if I'll ever be able to preach like that. But here here's what I know. And I want you to hear me very carefully what I'm about to say. There are plenty of people who can preach better than I can. But there is nobody who can preach a better God than I have. You understand what I'm saying? Nobody compares to Jesus. And unless you preach Jesus, I'm going to get you on that. Because I'm going to preach Jesus. So you might be able to, to say it better, but you won't have a better Jesus. Because there's, there's only one. And that's who we're focusing on. That's who Paul was, was crying out to this church. Don't put your faith in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And that's why... This Sunday when we finish up Colossians. That's why Paul's going to call out all these people and say, uh, greet this person and this person's a faithful servant. And this, He's talking about the family of God. He's talking about all these. And they're all serving the same Jesus. And, and he's drawing attention to them. Bless this ch- woman in the church that meets in her house. And you know all these folks. And, and But he when he ends, he says... The grace of God be with you all. It's always about, always about God, always about our Savior, and that's where our faith needs to lie. So, here's where we go with that. If that's true, then we need to be. We really need to be telling people about Jesus. We really do. Um, early and often, we need to tell people about Jesus. Because there, there is no other substitute for forgiveness, eternal life, salvation. There's no other solution. It's only Jesus. That's our message. And that's who we need to talk about. Let's pray.